Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. It looks like we have a lot of participants. I'm going to give it like a minute or so just so it kind of stabilizes and then I'll go ahead and introduce our presentation. It looks like it's more or less stabilized. Well, people, people will probably be trickling in. So I'll go ahead and start. Hi, everyone. My name is Maddie Haley, and I want to welcome you all to the webinar series for the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, the AIRP. Thank you all for joining us today. Because of the number of participants, your audio will be muted throughout the call. However, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat box or on, on your webinar console. This entire webinar is being recorded and will be available on the AIRP website, aiirpnetwork.ucla.edu. There will also be a short evaluation survey at the close of the webinar. We invite you to provide feedback on this webinar and also to provide suggestions for future webinars. In the interest of time, let's get started. We first want to acknowledge the Health Resources and Services Administration as the funding source for AIRP. Now, it is my honor to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jennifer Ames. Dr. Ames is a staff scientist at the Division of Research at Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, and a member of the AIRP Gender, Sexuality, and Reproductive Health Research Note. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ames. Uh, thank you, Maddie, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the ARP um, for the opportunity to be here today um, and to share our research. Um, I'm excited to present work associated with the gender, sexuality, and reproductive health node. Um, and before I dive in, I wanted to take a moment to tell you a bit about the node um, and its goals. So it's uh, led by doctors Lisa Crowen and Maria Masolo at Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. And our node, um, the guiding principle recognizes that sexuality and relationships are important contributors to life satisfaction, health, and well being. And the node's goals um, goal is to improve sexual and reproductive health care and outcomes for autistic people across the lifespan, um, with a focus on, on autistic women and LGBTQIA people. So, some of the, the node's priority areas um, are sexuality education. Uh, sexual and reproductive health services, um, sexual victimization and abuse, and LGBTQIA health. And activities around these topics are guided by input from our stakeholder advisory group, um, work we're doing to identify urgent knowledge gaps in these areas, and a focus on workforce development, um, specifically clinicians and researchers working in this area. And so while our node is, is um, addressing all of these topics, my presentation today will focus on uh, sexual and reproductive health services in particular. Uh, so I wanna start with a note on language. Um, we know that language is not neutral and especially in the context of sexual uh, and reproductive health, the language has been historically gendered, and this has contributed um, to alienating gender diverse and gender uh, expansive people and posed obstacles to um, accessing healthcare. Um, so it's important that uh, obstetric gynecological services, OBGYN services, extend to people with a vulva, a vagina, or a uterus, and care should not depend on gender. And our node has been working on a glossary of um, gender inclusive and affirming language in consultation with um, the gender sexuality and reproductive health nodes advisory group. And uh, we're seeking to use gender neutral and gender inclusive terms um, with regards to the healthcare topics in today's presentation. Um, so we'll use terms like gender expansive and gender diverse, um, which is inclusive of transgender, non-binary, non agender, gender fluid, and gender queer identities. Um, we will sometimes refer to women's health 
um, or women, which uh, well, when we're, we're describing um, studies which focused on people who were assigned um, female at birth and identify as female. Okay, um, so this is just a quick map of where we will go in today's presentation. So um, first, I'll start with some background on the intersection of reproductive health and disability. And then I will tell you a bit about a study of OBGYN services and pregnancy that we are um, conducting at Kaiser Permanente Northern California. And I'll show you some um, preliminary data from the study and discuss uh, the ongoing analyses that we have. And then uh, I'll move on to some potential clinical uh, implications of this work for improving access and care. And lastly, I'll discuss a few major data gaps in the field and um, some promising future directions for this work. Okay, so we'll start with some background. Um, and first off, the intersection of disability and reproductive health is a topic fraught with uh, the negative legacy of attitudes and policies that historically restricted um, the reproductive autonomy of people with disabilities. And the area is receiving a lot of renewed focus um, with a lens of reproductive justice. And uh, we are learning from this growing literature that people with disabilities often have less access to reproductive and sexual health resources than people without disabilities. And this includes um, lower utilization of family planning services, such as contraceptive counseling and contraceptive use among people with disabilities compared to people without disabilities. We also see uh, lower uh, screening rates of breast and cervical cancer among people with disabilities compared to people without disabilities. Um, and uh, it's important to note that this body of work has typically addressed the experiences of women and people with physical, intellectual, and sensory disabilities broadly. Um, and few studies have specifically focused on the reproductive health care experiences of people with uh, developmental disabilities, such as autism. So such studies are important because autistic people face similar reproductive health challenges to people with other disabilities. Um, but designing effective and inclusive interventions necessitates investigating and understanding how their experiences may also differ. And this is supported by literature um, suggesting that autistic people face unique challenges around reproductive health. So, um, for example, social and sensory differences in autism are often invisible to providers. Um, which can make it difficult for autistic individuals to obtain accommodations um, in healthcare settings. Further, um, autistic adolescents and young adults um, typically receive fewer education, sexual education resources than their non-autistic peers. And this can contribute to a higher risk of sexual abuse and engagement in sexual experiences that are unwanted or later regretted. Um, a handful of studies have also documented that autistic people have a higher risk of menstrual conditions, including uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, also known as PCOS, and uh, may experience greater pain and sensory and emotion and behavior problems, including self-injuring behavior that tracks with menstrual cycles. Uh, furthermore, there's been very little research on pregnancy in uh, autistic people, including obstetric risks and the quality of their prenatal care. Um, and the handful of studies that are out there suggest that some health risk factors that are associated with obstetric complications are more common and autistic people compared with non-autistic people. So this includes factors such as a higher BMI around the time of pregnancy, um, a higher likelihood of smoking during early pregnancy, 
higher rates of anxiety and depression and other psychiatric and medical conditions, um, and subsequently uh, uh, increased use of potentially teratogenic medications, um, meaning medications that can affect um, embryonic, embryonic development um, and potentially cause pregnancy loss um, or, or birth defects. There's also evidence that um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a lower likelihood of starting prenatal care in the first trimester. And initiating prenatal care um, in the first trimester is important um, for doing screenings and tests to make sure um, the birth parent and the baby are doing okay. And also for, for imparting resources about nutrition and medication management um, during pregnancy. Um, and there's also um, one study um, that has examined um, pregnancy complications and has noted in autistic people and has noted a higher risk of preeclampsia, um, gestational diabetes, and preterm delivery. And of the um, three studies on this slide, one of the studies was in Sweden, another was in Canada. Um, and so far, there's been very little research in a US context so far. So <clears throat> understanding barriers to reproductive health services um, may inform improvements to healthcare delivery for autistic people. And some of the um, potential barriers um, in this area include that adult primary care and OBGYN providers um, typically have little to no training in caring for autistic patients. Further, um, providers may make assumptions about their patients' um, sexual activity and not um, bring up certain reproductive um, healthcare topics with them. Um, relatedly, uh, OBGYN initiation may be delayed during the healthcare transition from pediatric to adult care. Um, and some procedures um, performed in OBGYN visits can be invasive and patient hypersensitivity and aversion to touch um, may deter people from going to the OBGYN visit. Um, and, and lastly, people with gender dysphoria and gender expansive identities um, may experience unique barriers in accessing um, reproductive health care. And uh, we know that these identities are more common among autistic people. OK, so the study we're conducting um, at Kaiser Permanente seeks to address um, a couple main questions. And these include, what does OBGYN utilization of autistic people look like in a large US sample? And then what are the factors associated with utilization of OBGYN care among autistic people compared with uh, people with other developmental disabilities and people with neurotypical development? Okay, so, um, we are conducting the study at Kaiser Permanente Northern California. And this is an integrated healthcare system of about 4.5 million members um, residing in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, up into Sacramento and um, down to Fresno. And within this member population, we've identified three groups of adults who are all aged 18 and over. Um, we have a, an autism group of about 1,400 adults. We have a, a group of other developmental um, disabilities, including cerebral palsy and intellectual disability, and that's about um, 3,300 people. And then we have a neurotypical group of about 5,700 people. And the neurotypical group was matched um, four to one on age and membership length to the autism group. And everyone in the study um, was a member for at least six months of each year between 2017 and 2019. So uh, we're using 
KP's electronic health record to examine uh, medical and psychiatric diagnoses, uh, healthcare visits, um, prescriptions for medications, and healthcare procedures during the study period of 2017 to 2019. And this presentation will be about um, our preliminary data related to visits to the OBGYN provider, um, excluding prenatal care and preventive care procedures, um, such as cervical cancer screenings and mammograms and hormonal contraception. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the sociodemographic characteristics of our study sample. Um, so people in the autistic and developmental, developmental disabilities groups were more likely than people in the neurotypical group to be white. Um, so 60% and 54% versus 40% in the neurotypical group. Um, people in the autistic and developmental disability groups were also more likely to have government subsidized health insurance. So 44% and 69% versus 12%. The people in the developmental disabilities group was on average 14 years older um, than people in the autism and uh, neurotypical groups. So 43 years of age was the average age in the developmental disabilities group compared to 29 in the autism and neurotypical groups. And um, the autism and neurotypical groups were age matched. So that's why the age is the same. And the people in the autistic group were uh, most likely to reside in neighborhoods of higher socioeconomic position. So about 32% resided in high SES areas. Um, relative to 25% in the developmental disabilities group and 21% in the neurotypical group. And um, the autistic group also had, was the most likely to have gender expansive identities. So 4% of people in the autism group had a gender expansive identity um, compared to less than half of a, a half of a percent in the other two groups. Okay, so in the next few slides, um, I will be showing bar graphs like this um, to compare the frequency of health conditions and healthcare utilization across um, the groups. And the first graph here on, on the left is showing the frequency of depression diagnoses. And 37.8% uh, of autistic people in uh, this purplish color had a depression diagnosis um, during this time period. And this is compared to 30.5% of uh, people with other developmental disabilities in red and 23.2% um, in uh, people with neurotypical development in yellow. And the asterisks here um, indicate that the depression rate was significantly higher in the autistic group um, compared to the other DD group um, and also compared to the neurotypical group um, when we controlled for the variables listed at the bottom of the slide, which included age, um, race, ethnicity, uh, the length of their Kaiser Permanente membership, their insurance payer, whether it was um, government or private insurance, the frequency of their primary care visits, and the neighborhood deprivation index, which is an indicator of um, neighborhood socioeconomic status. So um, anxiety, so this is depression, but anxiety, ADHD, eating disorders um, were other examples of psychiatric conditions that were more prevalent among autistic people in our sample relative to the other groups. So um, several physical health conditions, including overweight and obesity were more common in the autistic and other developmental disabilities groups compared with the neurotypical group. Um, so here about uh, 61 and 63% of people in the autism and other developmental disabilities groups 
were overweight or obese compared to 51% um, in the neurotypical uh, group. And other medical conditions um, such as diabetes, epilepsy, um, and autoimmune conditions were also more common among people in the autistic and other developmental disabilities groups as well. Okay, so now I will show you um, some of our preliminary findings with um, respect to OBGYN care. So this first um, graph here is showing the, just going to, the, uh, having a visit um, to the OBGYN, and this is excluding visits for um, pregnancy. And what we see is um, just under 60% of people in the autism group and the other developmental disabilities group had at least one OBGYN visit during the 2017 to 2019 um, period, compared to 73% um, of people in the neurotypical development group um, who went to the OBGYN. And so um, the people in the autistic and developmental disabilities groups were less likely to have an OBGYN visit than people in the neurotypical group. And this plot is showing OBGYN visits broken down by age. Um, and I'm showing the um, age distribution um, in the autistic group first. And there is a trend of, um, I'm gonna get my laser here a trend of increasing OBGYN use with age before going down uh, again, especially after age 60. And overlaying the neurotypical group on this graph, um, we see a similar trend with age, increasing visits to the OBGYN with age um, and that goes down at older ages. Um, but a, a larger proportion of um, neurotypical people visited the OBGYN at most ages, um, especially in uh, early adulthood. And lastly, adding the developmental disabilities group onto this plot, um, the DD group age trends are relatively similar to um, the trends in the autistic group. Um, with the largest differences um, in visits apparent um, across these, these ages of 18 to 39. So this is where we're seeing the biggest difference between um, the autism and DD groups compared to the neurotypical group. And these disparities in visits do diminish somewhat after age 40. You see less, less of a, a big difference there. Okay, so this is um, looking at cervical cancer screenings now. Um, and this is cervical cancer screenings are also known as a pap smear. And it's a procedure in which the doctor swabs a person's uh, cervix to collect cells that can be checked for cervical cancer. Um, and these are recommended um, once every three years, starting at age 21 through age 65. And um, what we saw here was about 50% of um, people in the autism group had a cervical cancer screening within this recommended three-year time period. Um, about 45.9% of people in the other developmental disabilities group had a cervical cancer screening. And both of these are um, less than what we saw in the neurotypical group where 72% of people um, got a cervical cancer screening in this recommended time frame. And these, uh, I just want to point out that um, these were adjusted um, for visits, frequency of visits to primary care. And this is also only looking at people age 21 plus. Okay. 
So this is looking at cervical cancer screenings by age, similar to how we looked at um, visits to the OBGYN by age before. And I think um, what's you know noticeable right away is that um, this disparity um, in cervical cancer screenings is visible at um, many ages um, and starts to, di to diminish at older ages. So it's um, a similar story as before where we, we really see some of the largest disparities at these younger ages. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Um, and now we'll talk about um, hormonal contraception and what we saw with these data. So um, all groups used a variety of reversible um, hormonal contraception options. So these included um, methods like oral contraceptive pills, um, which were the most popular method in all of the groups, um, intrauterine devices, injections, um, patch, hormonal patches and hormonal implants and hormonal rings um, were other forms of hormonal contraception that were used um, across all the groups. And um, what we saw that, you know, looking at all of these types of contraception combined, about 34.4% of people in the autism group um, used one of these forms within this three-year time period. Um, that's compared to 23.8% in the other developmental disabilities group and 46% um, in 0.3% in the neurotypical group. And I want to note a couple things about this. Um, first, the frequency of contraceptive use among people with other developmental disabilities appears low, um, just visually here, because this group was on average a bit older um, than the two other groups and um, included fewer women of reproductive age. Um, and so when we adjusted for age, the differences between the autism group and the other developmental disabilities group went away. Um, and I also want to note um, that um, these are not adjusted for sexual activity or partnership status, um, which are typically strong predictors of contraceptive use. And lastly, that um, these data reflect use during a three-year a three -year study period. So people in our sample um, could have started and stopped birth control um, or hormonal contraception before or after this window, um, and also tried multiple types of, of um, hormonal contraception, which we didn't look at. Okay, so um, there was um, some interesting variation across the groups in the types of contraceptive contraception um, that was used. So um, for example, um, autistic people and people with other developmental disabilities were more likely to be prescribed um, Depo-Provera um, compared with neurotypical people. So these dark parts of, of the graph down here is showing the proportion of people who were using Depo-Provera. Um, so it's about 6.9% in the autism group, 6.2% in the other developmental disabilities group, and um, a bit lower at 3.9% in the neurotypical group. And Depo-Provera um, is a injection form of um, hormonal contraception. So it's, it's a shot that you get every three months. Um, and so this, this um, was a more popular um, form of birth control in um, the autism and other developmental disability groups. Um, also, um, the autistic and developmental disability groups were more likely to be prescribed hormonal contraception for therapeutic use. So um, again, the dark part of these um, graphs is showing the proportion that was using um, hormonal birth control for a therapeutic reason rather than for birth control purposes. 
Um, and so about 13.8% in the autism group, 7.5% in uh, the other developmental disabilities group, and then 2.4% in the neurotypical development group. And we haven't explored um, what the indications for therapeutic use um, were in, in our um, population, but uh, some of the, the kind of typical therapeutic uses um, of hormonal contraception is to treat conditions um, such as dysmenorrhea, um, which is painful periods um, or painful cramps um, during periods, and um, also used to treat irregular bleeding um, and acne and some other types of conditions. And typically um, the therapeutic use was for oral contraceptives. We didn't see too much therapeutic use for other types of hormonal contraception. Okay, so now this is looking at hormonal contraception by age. And um, I think it's uh, rather striking here that the largest differences in contraception use are in adults ages 18 to 24 years old. And um, the differences sort of, in general, um, fewer people are using hormonal contraception over time. Um, and the differences between the groups diminish um, with age. So lastly here, we examined um, breast cancer screenings, um, which clinical guidelines recommend having every one to two years starting at age 50. Um, though people who have a family history of breast cancer um, may start earlier in their 40s. And um, these screenings are typically done through a mammogram, which is um, x-ray imaging of the breast. And um, what we saw, you know, we're looking just among people who were ages 40 plus um, in our population. And what we saw was actually relatively high rates of mammograms in all of the groups. Um, which demonstrates the effectiveness of outreach programs. Um, however, there was a small um, but significant difference in breast cancer screening with both um, people in the autistic and developmental disabilities groups being slightly less likely to receive a mammogram than people in the neurotypical group. Okay. So um, lastly here, we also examined several um, sexual and reproductive health diagnoses. Um, so this included menstrual disorders, um, which is a variety, encompasses a variety of conditions um, that can lead to heavy or painful or irregular bleeding. And um, we actually didn't see, once we adjusted for um, age and race, ethnicity, and membership length and insurance payer and socioeconomic status, and also OBGYN utilization, um, we didn't see a significant difference between the groups. And um, the reason we adjusted for OBGYN utilization is a lot of these conditions um, will get diagnosed by an OBGYN provider. And so we wanted to control for um, going to the OBGYN. Um, and let's see, there was some, you know, some of the conditions that go into menstrual disorders, we did see some variation um, specifically around polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. So a higher proportion of um, autistic people, 6% had um, a diagnosis of PCOS during this study period. Um, compared to 4.3% in the other developmental disabilities group and 4.7% in the neurotypical group. Um, and this is actually um, has been seen in several other studies, this higher um, rate of uh, PCOS.
and other conditions um, such as sexually transmitted infections um, were less common in the in among people in the autistic and developmental disabilities groups than um, in the neurotypical group. So 0.8% um, uh, of people in the autism group had a uh, sexually transmitted infection during this time period compared to 1.4% in the other developmental disabilities groups and 4.2% um, in the neurotypical group. So some of the, the takeaways of, of this preliminary um, research so far is that in comparison with neurotypical people, um, autistic people have lower utilization of multiple types of reproductive health care, um, including visits to the OBGYN, routine screenings, um, and use of hormonal contraception. And um, these differences persisted after taking into account sociodemographic factors and frequency of primary care visits. Um, and these disparities have implications for long-term health, including um, potential delays, for example, in cervical and breast cancer detection and treatment. Um, we also saw that many of these disparities emerged in early adulthood, which um, perhaps points to the transition period as being important um, to um, helping uh, or you know a place of intervention to increase um, utilization of OBGYN and reproductive health services. Um, I think it's also important, um, the last point here, that the disparities are present in our scenario of an integrated healthcare system um, where there are robust outreach programs um, for OBGYN and reproductive health care screening. And um, it's likely that disparities are larger in the broader US population where there is less access to these kinds of resources. So um, these analyses are ongoing, and we're seeking to answer a few additional questions with these data. So for example, what are the shared and unique predictors of OBGYN care in each of these groups? Um, and so factors we're examining include um, co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions, um, medications, frequency of other types of healthcare interactions, and sociodemographic factors. We're also asking what does um, sexual and reproductive health care look like during the transition period? Um, so in adolescence and early adulthood, when are people um, going to the OBGYN for the first time? When, what ages are they um, first starting to use um, hormonal contraception? Those kinds of questions. And then uh, we also have a sub-analysis examining um, changes in 2020 um, when many health services were delivered by a um, telemedicine or delayed um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, another analysis that's ongoing is understanding pregnancy and obstetric care um, in uh, our population. And so our objective is to describe the epidemiology of pregnancy and prenatal care um, in our autistic membership. And we have, we've identified at least 200 um, autistic people with a pregnancy history and about 340 pregnancies among them. And we'll be comparing them to, um, again, a developmental, other developmental disabilities group and a neurotypical group. And some of the um, factors we'll be looking at include um, pregnancy complications and birth outcomes. So, um, conditions like preeclampsia, um, perinatal um, depression and screening for depression um, and preterm birth. And we'll also look at um, kind of quality of prenatal care and routine screenings. So um, whether um, people received an ultrasound at 21 weeks, um, gestational diabetes and management of gestational diabetes and prenatal vaccinations like for um, Tdap and um, influenza. And some of the implications um, 
of this research for healthcare improvements um, we think are important. So uh, we hope that this work will lead towards improvements um, to accessing healthcare that is neurodivergent competent and um, accommodates a spectrum of differences in how people communicate and express and process information, um, especially as it pertains to pain and health issues across the life course. Um, we also hope it can inform educational resources to help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities manage reproductive health throughout the lifespan. And this may be especially important around periods such as the transition um, to adulthood and the onset of menstruation and later the onset of menopause. And there are also um, potentially opportunities for patient and provider facing tools for OBGYN care. So resources to help patients prepare for their OBGYN appointments and um, know what to expect for different types of procedures. And um, however, uh, the electronic health record can only tell us so much. And for a complete picture and a deeper understanding um, of people's experiences, it will be super important in qualitative studies to talk to people about their experiences and accessing um, OBGYN care and what they experienced during pregnancy. So synthesizing um, qualitative and quantitative analyses um, will help generate ideas for um, feasible interventions. And um, there have been uh, several really excellent qualitative stud studies published um, within the last couple of years related to autistic experiences um, in pregnancy and parenthood and also menopause um, that are worth checking out. And then um, here, you know, in consul consultation with um, the gender sexuality and reproductive health nodes um, advisory group, um, we've also identified um, several topics where there's just a dearth of information and we hope to explore these topics more with our data set and also hope to see a lot more research in general on these topics. And these include um, work focused on um, the experiences of autistic people during puberty um, and menopause and LGBTQIA plus health, um, including access to uh, gender affirming care. And um, additionally, making sure that there is representation across sociodemographic backgrounds um, within all of these topics. So this is um, a slide of some references that I um, referred to earlier on in the presentation, and I, I won't dwell on this, but if you want to check any of these out, um, you can come back to the video of recording of this presentation and, and get to this um, slide. And um, I also want to thank my fabulous uh, research team at Kaiser Permanente and also um, all the feedback that we've gotten from um, the ARP JSR node and our GSR advisory group, um, specifically around language and data gaps and research directions um, for the future. And I also want to acknowledge um, the funding from um, the Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit Fund and NICHD. Um, and here's my email address, and I'll put it in the chat um, too. But you know, please um, ask questions during the Q and A, and feel free to reach out to me um, with more questions, and we can set up a, a conversation. And. Um, I'll make another last plug for the Gender, Sexuality, and Reproductive Health Node. Um, so again, Lisa Crowen and Maria Masolo are um, the leaders of this node and their email addresses are here. Um, and you should totally reach out if you're interested in learning more about the node's activities. Um, we're very eager to help develop um, and connect and expand the network of researchers who are working to address these topics. And thank you so much. Um, that's the end of my presentation. And 
Um, I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ames. So I think we're gonna start with the questions that are already in the Q&A um, box. So uh, somebody asked, I believe this is in reference to um, the barriers you were describing at the beginning of the presentation. So the question is, do you think that some of this is related to the clinics not very ADA excessively ideal? Um, for example, don't she, uh, the person doesn't see lift systems in clinics for those in wheelchairs. Yeah, I think that some of it, you know, depending, I think the barriers are different depending on the disability. Um, and so some of these, the prior literature um, could be ADA related. Um, it could be in the actual examining room, you know, um, to go through like a, a cervical cancer screening. Um, you know, you have to get up onto the, the table and um, put your feet in stirrups. And these are all uh, can be not accommodating um, depending on what your disability is. Um, so yeah, I think that's why it's really important to look um, at disabilities uh, and understand the unique experiences depending on what your disability is. All right. Oh, um, somebody in the chat also asked if it would be possible if you could uh, stop sharing the slides probably so we can see your face better when we're doing this discussion. Oh, yeah. Let's see, how do I give me a second? I'll figure this out. No problem. Hi. Were you able to see my face during the presentation? I hope so. Yes. Oh, definitely. Okay. okay. Um uh so another question is can you define therapeutic? I believe that was in reference to the uh contraceptives, the oral contraceptives. So yes. Therapeutic use, yeah. Right. So therapeutic use um is for treating a health condition rather than for birth control purposes. So um, some people will take um, hormonal contraception because they have painful periods and they wanna regulate their menstrual cycle. Um, and it's not because they're trying to prevent pregnancy. Okay. Um, and another, another question slash thing to discuss was, uh, we should be looking at premature menopause, which be, may be reflected by the low use of birth control in the early 50s. That's a really interesting um, idea. Yes, I think, I think we definitely should be looking at menopause. And um, yeah, I really like um, that hypothesis. It's really interesting. Um, another question. Um, regarding the study sample compared to the neurotypical counterparts, people with ASD and DD are more likely to have government subsidized health insurance, but they're not, but they are more likely to live in neighborhoods of higher SES. I believe, uh, is that socioeconomic? I, I'm not sure what SES is. For. Okay. Um, what would be the implications of these characteristics uh, uh, on the findings? Also wondering why the prenatal care was not included in the study given various health risk factors for pregnancy among people with ASD mentioned in the background. Yeah, okay. So let's see, the first question is about um, how someone's socioeconomic status is maybe contributing to these findings. And um, I think, you know, uh, the higher SES that usually means that you're coming from a more resourced background, but not always. It's it's a um, kind of a proxy measure, and we can't really make that assumption um, because people who have um, higher SES don't always have resources, especially if there's a, a disability as well. Um, and so, um, in terms of the government insurance, um, people with disabilities are eligible for government, with certain disabilities are eligible for government insurance. And so having government insurance isn't always related to someone's socioeconomic status. Um, and so I, you know, I think we, we adjust for it to um, kind of address people who maybe are coming from a little bit more of a resource background. Um, but it's something we'd have to explore more. And I think talk to people and, and learn like what are the resources that you had in accessing reproductive health care. Um, and the second question, oh, can you remind me what it was? Uh, wondering why prenatal care was not included in the study given um, health risk factors for pregnancy among people with uh, ASD. Yeah, 
that's coming. We the the study just started um, a few months ago, and so we're working we're working towards it. We have um, we're extracting those data um, right now, and so stay tuned. Um, we just haven't haven't gotten to that step yet. Another question is, do you see more health outcome disparities between ASD versus ID with, sorry, ASD with ID versus ASD or severity levels of ASD? That's a really um, interesting question and one that we will try to understand um, with our data. I think um, it, people who were um, diagnosed with autism through um, the Kaiser Permanente Assessment Centers. There tends to be a lot more detailed data on um, their whether there's a co-occurring intellectual disability and um, you know information about their other co-occurring conditions where we can look at that. But for a lot of people in our population, we don't have that kind of detailed information. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question, and I appreciate you asking it. Another question is, how does medical body shaming intersect with reluctance to get care? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question, too. So there is some evidence um, that uh, people with higher BMIs um, are less likely to go to the OBGYN and less likely to receive a cervical cancer screening. And, and that certainly is um, a hypothesized factor. Um, and I, you know, I think that's um, one of those topics that we can't look at super clearly with electronic health record data. Like that is something that would be a great topic for a qualitative study and in understanding those, um, those feelings going into the appointment. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting area. Thank you. All right. Um... One more qu well, one question is, do you know about any support groups or research studies on menstrual irregularities and concerns? I wish I um, was more knowledgeable on this. I am sure there are people working on this topic. Um, do you mean among aut autistic people, um, I'm guessing, and not just more generally among people with disabilities? Um, if you want to reach out to me by email, I need to find those studies too, so um, we can do it together. Um, so just reach out to me by email and I'll let you know. Uh, another question is, did you take into account the age of autism diagnosis? No, no not yet. And that is on our list. I think um, for people who were diagnosed at Kaiser Permanente, we'll be able to find their age of diagnosis. And I think that would be an important factor to consider. Um, okay, I think we'll do one more question unless any more pop up. Um, are there any efforts to look into the implications of IPV and other forms of abuse with OBGYN access? Yes, um, we have been working on extracting um, those Diagnose. So there's screening that happens for IPV. This is intimate partner violence, um, and there's screening that happens um, in both primary care and the OBGYN setting. And I think it's a um, the screening happens always happens during pregnant for pregnant people. Um, so that is something that we'll be looking taking a closer look at. Um, yes. Um. Uh, uh, this one more. Uh, have you considered including the perspectives of autistic OBGYN healthcare providers? Ooh. Um, well, now I will. Yeah, I think that would be. <laughs> um, you know, I wonder. We'd have to do some work to identify um, if any of our providers um, would would want to disclose their autism and also participate in a study. But I think that would be really fascinating. Great. All right. Well, I think that's all of the questions. So let me just uh, send the link to the um, upcoming webinar. So it is our uh, September webinar hosted by the AIRP Genetics Research Node Leader, Dr. Julian Martinez. Um, I'll go ahead and drop his link, drop the link to the register in the chat. 
Um, this is the, yeah, that was the social media. Um, and then, this, yeah, this is the webinar. Um, and then if you could please complete this brief survey, that would be amazing. And otherwise, I think that's everything. Um, thank you again, Dr. Ames, and thank you everyone who was able to attend. Uh, we will see you in September. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.